Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the Coracle Live Books, Bards, and Ballads, brought to you by the Sisterhood of Avalon. I am Morgane, uh, co-chair of the Coracle Committee. And I got to say, I'm really, really excited to be sitting down and chatting with one of my favorite people, um, Ben Stimson, who and we're going to be talking about his book. His book was published, his first book was published back in September. And yes, we all have an Ancestor Whispers. And I mean, I could read his his bio right off, off the back, but I'm just gonna say he's a therapist. He teaches, um, he lectures, he has all these courses. He has many, many um, interests that he studies. And I'm hoping that we have enough time to just kind of, you know, touch on, on everything, uh, his website. And oh, thank you, Shah. Shah put oh, in the website, benstimson.com. And because we only have an hour, I want to start. And so we were just talking, chatting uh, just a couple minutes ago, you and I and Shah. And Shah and I took a class with you mm -hmm. two years ago, Heirlooms of the Soul. It's it's unbelievable that it was that was that long ago. And now, even with that class, it was all about our past and our experiences within our own life that we were touching upon. Mm -hmm. Was that like the beginning for you? Or were you already starting to look into ancestor work and ancestor veneration? Yeah, absolutely. No, abs no this has been a, almost a, a 10 year long thing now for me. When I really think about it, um, I started, well, in, in truth, it's been a lifelong thing for me. Um, you know, I, I, many people who know my work and I see Laurie has seen my interviews with other people, uh, anybody who knows me or has read the book will know I'm from originally from Wales. I, I grew up in Canada here. And, um, one of the biggest pieces around that was, uh, losing my connection with my family back home and causing a lot of issues for me, um, in my personal life, in my social life, um, even my intellectual life. And, um, and, and a, really a coming back to a sense of self has also been a coming back to a relationship and relationship with family, relationship with roots. Um, and, uh, and that all culminated in the decision to move back to Wales, hopefully at the end or, or, or closer to the end of this year. So I would say that family has always been very important to me, but it's been uh, always couched in story because physically I wasn't able to interact with, with my, like I couldn't go to the burial grounds where my family was buried. I didn't have, I didn't grow up with my cousins or anything like that. So, um, so through story and through connecting in and, you know, trying to connect in with sense of belonging has been big, but I would say it really started to ramp up for me about seven years ago when I was involved with a spiritual tradition where ancestor work in a spiritual capacity was, um, was, uh, was really important. And uh, and then ever since then, here we are, me with a book that is published. Like, yes, <laughs> it's so exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. It really, really is. So, so this is kind of what what got you started. So, I'm, I just want to start with the basics because, as you know, at the beginning of the book, you talk about animism, and this is something that um, I don't know if I have a a full understanding of the concept. I'm I'm hearing the word a lot and the Coracle has the Women in Druidry conference coming up and uh, Carrie Lee from Wales is doing our keynote and is and it's about how animism can help the planet. So what um how would you describe animism as as simply as the lay person? How would you describe well, animism? Well, I'll, I'll preface that. I'll do a genital injury on you all. I'll preface that with a lot of hand waving and, and diagram um, talking. I would say that, that that word animism has really become a buzzword in the past, say, 10 years. And what it's really replaced is kind of the, in the Western kind of context, this idea of shamanism, right? This idea of, of, of working with spirits that are involved, like uh, in nature, right? When you look at animism now, how we're understanding it is um, that everything in the world, everything in the universe is potentially enlivened with spirit, um, but that that is free flowing, right? So this idea that everything, 
from the cup that I'm drinking out of, from those beautiful glasses that you're wearing, Morgane, right? From um, even the computers that we're, we're interacting through. Everything has a spirit, but that spirit is connected to an identity that is temporary, right? So we're all temporary, right? Um, we don't like to think that, but we are. We're all temporary. But we're enlivened with a spirit that in this temporary phase has taken on the identity of, 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 of whatever thing that we're talking about, right? So that sense of animism is that that spirit is free-flowing and will flow into something else, will become something else, will change, will grow, right? And I think that um, that when we look in, at the world, we then see everything as being connected by that unifying spirit, whatever you want to call it. God, Awen, Imbas, right? Or Nufre in, in the Welsh context, right? I know Awen and Nufre are slightly different there, but, but operate in a very similar way way you know so layman's terms animism is everything in the universe is enlivened with spirit and that spirit is free-flowing has a certain consciousness and a certain intelligence but um that it is so different from how we in our you know neural networks here would uh, would identify it and so part of that working with animism is opening up yourself to communicating with different forms of life communicating with different forms of experience, but also figuring out your attachments to those things, right? Letting go. So when it comes to death work, animism is really important because everything dies. Every single thing dies. Um, you know, regardless of how you look at it, everything changes. We all have changed, right? I'm no longer the little boy that came to Canada eight, uh, almost 30 years ago, right? In the same way that you're, you, Morgane, are not the same woman as 20 years ago, right? All of us have changed. And so those other versions of ourselves were that identity in that moment. Now we are different. And in, you know, 10, 20 years, we'll be different again, right? So that understanding with animism and death is of transformation as opposed to strict endings. I, does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. But so, okay, I just had a thought. So if, okay, you're not that same little boy and obviously I'm not the same woman from 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Those are the changes in us physically, emotionally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of the spirit within the animism. Is it the same spirit or does our spirit also change? Well, I, I think that it really depends. Let's bring in the hmm, let's bring in the story of Taliesin and Keridwen, right? Okay. So Taliesin was a Guion Bach. And then he partook of the three drops, whether that was intentional or accidental. I know that the uh, the question is still out there, right? Um, but he changed. Now then what happened? He was chased around the universe by Keridwen, who constantly changed as well, right? She was still Keridwen, he was still Taliesin, regardless of what creatures they were turning into, right? But it was an evolutionary process. When you actually look at the the the, the various forms that they took, it was an evolutionary process that we were going through, right? And so each time they became something different, but they were still the same. In the same way that um, I, that's a very animistic process. In the same way that, you know, the, the clay that was in my cup that was formed, when, now it's a cup. But when you think about it, that clay contains the decayed material that were once part of somebody else's body, right? Or something else's body, right? So is it a tree? Is it, you know, the, all the animals? Is it all the leaves? No, it's a cup now. When I crush this up, if I crush this up, right, and put it down into the soil, those pieces will become something different again, right? So it's those temporary moments um, of, of identity, but it's still a continuation because those molecules are still there, right? I love that. I never really, I mean, you know, you look at your cup and it's like, okay, the, it came from mud, the clay, the earth, so something. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a really interesting interesting way of looking at it. I'm going to have to give that some thought. Uh, for everybody listening, I just want to let you know that the chat is open. So if you have um, any questions for Ben to put them in the chat. And um, 
I will forward them on to him or we will wait till the end, depending. So please do not be shy and um, jump in at any time with your questions, okay? Thank you. So um, dualism and non-dualism, how does that fit in with everything else? Of course. So, um, so let's zoom out a little bit to give some context. So, um, one of the one of the pieces of the book is I talk about in order to understand what death is, we need to first for ourselves understand what life is. And so, one of the big parts of the the, the very, very first chapter, and people can go to the website if they want to read that. It's all free on the Llewellyn website, which is kind of cool. Um, so that piece about non dualism and dualism is really a a um, it's a sense of where you understand your relationship with the divine. Are you separate from the divine or are you the same as the divine? You know, we often see in, in Western occultism, um, this idea and, and paganism and spirituality, we see both views. We see one that we're the child of a goddess or that we are, you know, um, we're drops of the ocean that will return to that ocean, right? That is that classic dualism versus non-dualism, right? Dualism is that we are separate, that we are children of the gods, and that we are different than them. We can become like them, but we're fundamentally different, right? Whereas non-dualism is that inside of us, we have a spark that is part of that divinity, and our, our soul progression is getting back to union with that divinity, right? So if you think of it in that way, with reincarnation versus like kind of singular lives, right? That's a really important point when it comes to thinking about the ancestors, right? Because if you believe in reincarnation, then the question is, well, how can there be ancestors if we're reincarnated? That leads into another topic that I talk about, which is this idea of soul parts. So the idea that we are maybe made up of multiple different parts that are all interacting in this moment, in this time to um, to become the individuals that we are now. And then when we die, parts of them go off and form new individuals, but are still connected to us. And then other parts kind of linger in some sort of afterlife um, and, 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 and those pieces, right? So depending upon kind of what culture you're in, and the frustrating thing I'll talk about Celtic culture is um, because of the, uh, of, the, of the interest of the sort of Avalon here, um, is that we never really get a direct sense of what those cultures actually believed when it came, comes to these pieces, right? You obviously have the Christian overlay, but you also have a fundamental kind of Judea, um, uh, uh, Celtic, um, and particularly the Welsh point of view too, ancient British Welsh um, point of view too. And there's so many different strands that you can pull there. So that piece around non-dualism versus dualism becomes an important point for us now in the 21st century for, you, for us individually to understand for ourselves because that will then affect how we work with spirit, how we work with God, how we work with all of those beings, right? So that soul parts is that mm -hmm. term that you used? So you know, sometimes you meet someone and you feel like you've known them forever. So yeah. if we have soul parts that are going into many people as opposed to just we are being reincarnated into one person but our parts could that be construed as when we meet somebody is that another part of our soul uh, absolutely but, i mean again if if you believe in the concept of reincarnation but not everybody does not everybody believes that reincarnation is a thing that we only get one life and then we go off into some sort of spirit world or we move into other things we come other things right so, so the idea of like, you know, when you meet somebody and you just, you feel like you've known them for a long time, right? Very much so. That could very well be. Or that you, if in another form of reincarnation, you lived a life with them at some point. Right? Um, there's so many ways to see all of this, right? And when you look at different cultures, that's the fun piece. It's understanding for yourself and also in the cultural view, um, how that fits in, Right. Um, I, now I see all the questions about reincarnation coming up. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, Lori saying it, it warps her brain and I'm listening to you about soul parts and then it's like, that boggles my mind, you know? And, and it does, and it does because we grew up in a Christian paradigm where we only get three parts to ourselves. Because think of it this way, this idea of parts is not actually all that different from the idea of body, mind and spirit, right? 
we, we're not used to seeing it that way because when we die, we're understanding that the body just is, you know, just a body. It's like a thing, it's a coat you take off, right? From that Christian, Judaic um, point of view. But when you actually look at it, many cultures around the world have very similar ways. They just have more parts. You look at the ancient Egyptian culture, right? You have the shadow, you have the name, you have the, 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 the bar, you have the heart, you have all of these pieces inside of you, um, the, the physical body, the shadow body, all of these pieces, right? And they all come together to make up an individual. That's why they all need to be protected um, for you know, in the afterlife, right? So it's not all that different. In, in, in European traditions, bring in the, the ancient Norse and the Germanic here, this is why somebody's name is so important because their name is part of who they are because it's connected in with re reputation and honor. This is why singing somebody's name is so important because that part of them is then reinvigorated every time. It's also why we have namesakes. When names are given to children further down the line, it's because you know certain names have power. And so giving it to that child will take on part of that power, in which case then that child is in a form of reincarnation of that original person, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so Laurie says, can we be a reincarnation of an ancestor but still connect with the version of them we have learned about? Totally, absolutely. That's a really powerful question. Um, I personally believe that, yes, you can. Um, I personally believe that, yes, you can. And, and you do hear of this. This is where the nuances of reincarnation become really, really cool. Because if you only see the individual as being reincarnated in totality to their next life, then what's left over to interact with, right? But when you look at Hinduism and Buddhism and, and, and many of these reincarnation traditions, there is this idea of soul parts. So what you're actually interacting with is a, a part of that original self and we see this on like um, Avatar The Last Airbender, really, really good show. You see this, the current Avatar is interacting with his previous incarnations um, and it's all inside his head, right? He's interacting with parts of himself, but those are the personalities. And so the personality of that life, right? So again, it depends on how you see the self, right? If you see the self as concentric circles of, of, of self, if you look at like in yoga practice, right, you've got the various bodies, right? Then what you're interacting with is the personality, which is just one of those circles, right? If that makes sense. Yes. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> See, I even I can get all caught up in it because it's, you know. Are I'm... all of our parts here at the same time? Is there a higher part of us somewhere else? Oh, Laurie, I love these questions. Very good questions, but I think they're, they may border on, on very specific things. I can only give specific you know, ideas about those. Um, I think it depends on the culture that you come from, right? So there are traditions where, uh, there are traditions, especially in Buddhism, where the idea is, um, you know, the splitting off. And so you have then multiple people who all claim um, lineage from one soul. You see this a lot in like the Tibetan Tulku tradition, for example. Um, the movie Little Buddha uh, with Keanu Reeves, where he you know, puts face bait on and pretends he's Indian. <laughs> really, really bad. But um, it, this happens in that. So the, the main Lama reincarnates into three different bodies. And so then all three of them become you know, aspects of that lineage. Um, and that question about higher part is really big because again, we then have to ask ourselves, what do we mean by that, right? Who is that higher part? Who is that higher self? Maybe that higher self does encompass multiple living people, right? That starts to get into really bigger questions of, you know, what is the nature of the universe, right? We look at the universe in a, as a quantum computer, which is becoming a, a very popular thing in the new age tradition. Um, oh, you're welcome, Laurie. Absolutely. Um, this idea of like quantum computing is literally finding every path possible, as opposed to binary computing, which is one going down one path to get to the end. It's literally splitting and doing every single path simultaneously. There are traditions that would say that, that, that the divine, that God is incarnating in the world as all of us all simultaneously living itself out, right? So there's all, all, all sorts. 
yeah, all sorts of pieces. Okay, um, I, and I know you cover this in the book because I did read it, but this is this is mostly for me. Ancestors, mm -hmm. who are they? So, I mean, I I honor my my maternal grandmother, right? So she raised me, so I look at her as my mother as well as my grandmother. But now, last year, I had a cousin pass away. She's only a year and a half older than me. She's my cousin. But like a sister cousin or a cousin sister, you know, you know. So do do I can I am I able to consider her an ancestor? She's basically my peer. Well, you tell me then. I'm not here to tell anybody what they should do or what they can do. That's not my point. But for you, based on your understanding of what ancestor is, they fall under that definition. I think she does because I find myself turning to her for lots of things, stupid mm -hmm. things, important things, whatever things, mm -hmm. you know, so I find myself and it's not that, and this sounds cruel, she, she, I wouldn't say she was, she had a lot of wisdom, you know, um, but she had a, di a certain way of looking at things, so mm -hmm. much different than me, so we had a tendency to kind of lean on each other but then you also have those that are younger than you that have passed so can they also or that this if this comes into you know back to what Lori asked if we could be a reincarnation of someone but if someone in your family that you feel very close to but is say three decades younger than you and they pass through the veil can they be considered an ancestor or are they considered are you considered their ancestor? See, this is where it starts to get like what I'm I, what I'm hearing is that you have a desire to honor this person and the contribution and work with them spiritually, right? To to include them in some sort of spiritual practice where they're honored, right? Mm -hmm. The question "Can I?" really comes down then to technicalities, right? A lot of people get caught up on this, and it's a very Western mindset compartmentalizing spirituality you know um it's all about relationship right so if we look at ancestor veneration as a particular compartmentalization of spirituality then yes there is a particular way that you would work with those individuals depending on how you you define what an ancestor is right and that makes sense. You know, looking at spirituality all over the world, you have these categories of beings and then appropriateness of, of how to work with those or how to honor those or, or worship them, right? But there's a lot of variance and, and continue continuums between all of those, right? And this is, the, this is really the whole point of the book. So I, I would feel like a hypocrite if I were to say here, Morgane, and say, you need to do this, you can't do that, because that's not my point. That's not my role. That's not my right. I don't have that power. It's our um, journey. Yeah, it is. It is. So, but that, that being said, I feel like even if you didn't see them as an ancestor, that doesn't mean that you can't honor them. But then the question is, what is appropriate? in working with an ancestor versus working with another dead person. Because not all dead people are ancestors, but not all ancestors are dead people either, right? At least how I see it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm gonna be jumping all over the place because I have a couple <laughs> of questions, but one is connected to something we're going to talk about a little bit later. So, all right, so you use the word venerate, venerating your ancestors. Is that, would you consider that to be the same as worshiping them? I mean, is it, or just honoring, but, or worshiping them like the divine? You know, like I go to my altar to the goddess, would I do the same thing with my ancestors? This is, again, it comes down to um, the, the technicalities and pieces, right? So what, 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 how can I say this? The issue with the English language is that it's so couched in very particular terms, right? So worship, venerate, and, and honor. 
have very particular Christian ways of, of seeing those things, right? So if I were to say I'm worshiping my ancestors, people would be like, oh, but that's only for God. Like, well, what are you doing, right? Because worship is only to God in the English language because of the Christian context, right? But if you go to other traditions where the identity of an ancestor is very fluid, sometimes an ancestor is so far back and have become so powerful and elevated that they are gods, then yes, you're worshiping ancestors through this tradition, right? So the language that we're using is is um, is 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 flawed and it has connotations. It's the same way that when people talk about witchcraft, Mara Starling, who I, I think you've had on the Coracle, but if you haven't, I highly recommend yeah, she's been on the, this and she also did a workshop. Plus she Perfect. was able to get a ninefold. Ah, right, 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 yes. So she talks about this when it comes to the English word witch versus the Welsh word swinderite, right? Charmer, um, or then this hospice, right? This idea of witch has a very particular English connotation, but when you place it out on to, into the world, it doesn't necessarily always translate, but it's forced onto a lot of traditions, right? And then, of course, what do people have in their head? Well, this idea of what witch, a very particular view of what that looks like, right? doesn't fit so no. when it comes to worship honoring venerate right um i like honoring but sometimes it is more than honoring sometimes it's actually actively working with them sometimes it's propitiating them so giving them offerings in order to stop them from doing things sometimes it's it is worship i have certain deities that are ancestral to who i am and so worshiping them is ancestral Right, I have certain um, saints that I I venerate, or that I'm I'm very interested in venerating. Right, Saint Winifred in North Wales. I, I where I'm from originally is like twenty minutes away from Holywell in North Wales, and Saint Winifred, Winifred, um, yeah, and her Holywell, um, and I think that's going to be on your tour. And if it isn't, then I highly recommend it. But it's one of those things. She is a genius loci of the place that I'm from. So I go and venerate because she's an ancestor of the place that I'm from. You know what I mean? So it's it depends, you know. And it, again, it comes down to how do you perceive the difference between deity and ancestor? In many African traditional religions, for example, right, the deities are ancestors because they gave birth to all of humanity, right? And so then it becomes a question of what's the nuance there? And that's where the language just is, is, is awkward. Um, and so, you know, when you're going to your uh, ancestral shrine or when you're going to your deity shrine working with the, the, the seven mothers, for example, right? Um, I understand that the Sister of Avalon sees them as ancestors of, of, of self, right? Uh, well, I'm asking, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I look at the goddesses as ancestresses myself. Okay. okay. And, I, and I'm not sure... I don't know. Now I'm going to have to ask Jenna. Oh, ask yourself? Yeah. You're making that determination for yourself based on your relationship with them. That's already informing you then, okay, how are they not ancestors? Therefore, who are ancestors to me, right? It's a good question to be asking yourself. Now, do you feel it's necessary to do, you know, I have my basic DNA, I which I had done, but I have not really done any genealogy at all do you think that that is um an important facet of the ancestral work is that we need to know you know not just the the, the lineage but the actual people and who who is my grandmother's grandmother and and all of that i'm not so sure i'm not so sure that i i, I do uh, and i'll explain why i again so much of how we think about all of these topics are culturally based, right? They're culturally created. So in many traditions, um, in many traditions, the, the, the ancestors who are beyond living memory are understood as a collective and you work with or you venerate or you honor the collective. Sometimes you only worship the very first ancestor who steps forward as, as, a, uh, as a spokesperson. Right. A lot of Asian traditions, Chinese tradition particularly, it's first mother and first father, the heads of the family, right? So it's one of those, for us, 
partially because of, of Christianity, in particular Catholicism. It's the, you need to have these names because if you don't have their names, then God's not going to know in doomsday so that they're not going to appear, right, and be judged, right? That's the whole point of, of writing down names in, in church registers, right? The whole system of genealogy in the West is really built upon a lot of those Christian precepts, right? And the, what we find important, which are the names, because if you don't have the name, then you don't have your identity. You can't say their name in prayer, oh, so on, so on, so on, right? So it's one of those, it really comes down to your cultural understanding. For me, I feel like there's a connection and relationship when I have a name, but there's also a connection and relationship when I go to a place that I knew that my ancestors came from. I might not know their name, but I know that they are here in this landscape, just as the landscape in those moments are my ancestor, because so much of my family background. I think the other piece around that is also in the West, we privilege biological relationship over other forms of relationship. And I was having this conversation, um, and I always get asked this, this question about adoption. What if I'm adopted? Who am I? Who am I suddenly if I'm not if I'm adopted? Who am I? Right. And again, it comes back to well, go subconsciously and see what you're actually asking here. Right. What you're actually asking is, um, who am I? Because I don't know who my where my DNA came from. Well, you know where your family came from, the family you grew up in, the family you're connected with. They might be your adopted relatives, but what does that mean? Like, why is that different from, you know, the, the people who gave you your DNA, you know? Because of culture. Culture tells us, our, our Western culture says this is important. Right? So, okay, I'm going to see if I can say this so it actually makes sense. <laughs> um. <laughs> my head is bopping all over the place. So we're talking culture, all these different cultures around the world. Um, we've also, we talked earlier, and I, I want to touch on um, your ancestor work. You, you said, okay, you were from Wales, you moved to Canada. You know, um, you do have in the book, you know, the, 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 the situations that arose because you were this strange little Welsh kid in Canada, you know, so for you moving back to Wales, this, this is part of your work. It's part of your journey, your inner work, whatever. So culturally for you going back to Wales fits in very well with what you're doing, trying to do studying. But so we take cultural and go into, and I really don't like this term, but I'm going to say it anyway, cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Boston in the States, all right? But I was raised by my grandmother, who was Portuguese. I am very, I connect personally, I de identify very strongly with my Portuguese heritage, but I'm not actually, I didn't grow up in Portugal. So even though I'm Portuguese, does, does that, become cultural appropriation, or I've been a yoga teacher for over 20 years. A lot of stuff that I have done through the years is Hindu, Hindu goddess, you know, talked early, body, mind, spirit, that's yoga, that's, that's union. Is that cultural appropriation if I'm leaning on something because this is something I've been interested in studying in for so long, but if I take part of that culture into myself, am I appropriating that? I'm not Indian. I'm not Hindu. You know, I was a Catholic until I was 15 and then I was pagan. So culturally speaking, am I attached? You're attached to Wales going home. Am I attached to Boston? Well, yeah. But hmm. is it appropriation if I do anything else from other any other culture that has nothing to do with this, you know, older white woman from Boston of all places, you know. Mm. Does that does that make sense, or did I? I, I think I understand what you're saying. I and I yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. So I, I think what you're asking, and tell me if I'm wrong. What you're asking is, how do people connect in with cultures of their ancestors if they didn't grow up in those cultures themselves? Well, even I, if there's something in, like, okay, so a lot of us were in the we're in the sister sisterhood of Avalon. We're not mm -hmm. Welsh. Mm -hmm. But this is the tradition that we've chosen for ourselves. For whatever reason we've done that, mm -hmm. are we culturally appropriating 
your heritage for our spiritual tradition. So I have a lot to say on this. I have a lot to say on this, but okay. it's one of those things that I think it depends on, like it depends on the context. This is where it becomes a really big, important thing. I think I address it in the book, but I certainly, if I didn't, then I'm going to talk to that piece right now, right? So um, I think a lot of people in the diaspora, regardless of what community you come from, right? They have a sense of my homeland is where my ancestors come from, right? Now that in itself is doing to one of two things. A, it's creating a vision of that homeland that isn't yours, right? But it may have been passed down in the family to you. And two is it's creating a, maybe a separation from the landscape that you're on now. So there are two, two relationships going on, two relationships being affected, right? Because I certainly have friends over here in Canada who, um, you know, their great, great grandparents came from Ireland, Scotland, Wales, all of, somewhere over there, right? And so they've been told in their culture about that place but it's the place from 200 years ago, right? You, in Boston, very good example. How many Boston Italians or New York Italians are there who still speak about Italy, but it's the Italy of the 1920s, 1890s, right? So it's that idea of you're taking the culture from the place, but the cultural identity is still really strong, right? So then the traditions, the beliefs, the ways of thinking are all the same, very similar, just divorced from the place. But there's still an unnatural and like connection to that place. Not unnatural, sorry. There is still a strong connection to that place, even if it's somewhere you've never actually been yourself. So it's 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 nuanced, right? It's very different from if you know a white woman from Los Angeles suddenly puts a bindi on her head and says, "I'm Hindu now and have never been to India." I've only ever been to hot yoga down the street, and uh, and then she's chanting mantras left, right, and center. Don't come at me. Don't send me messages, please. But you know, it's very different because that's completely divorced from that culture. Very different if that person had you know gone and connected with local community, gone to temple, gone and and maybe did you know yoga in the temple or yoga with an Indian structure. You know, all those things, right? The cultural pieces. So it depends, it really depends. What I think is very important is when people so connect with an, a landscape because of their ancestors, that they suddenly feel ownership over that landscape. And that's where I, as somebody who was born over there, but grew up in the diaspora, can say full well is really annoying and really destructive. And we see that all the time, unfortunately, as people who have a strong sense of, I am Celtic, and then deciding that they, growing up in the United States, have a right to suddenly talk about the politics of the UK or talk about the politics of Scotland or Wales as if they know anything about it, right? And that becomes very destructive and erasing, erasing right? I think it also, and I know many of you um, Welsh and pagan writers of right now are speaking about this as well, this idea that, you know, people in the diaspora, because they've read something, suddenly feel like they're an expert and can speak over. Now, that being said, I don't think this has ever been a problem with Sister of Avalon, but other groups, um, particularly Norse pagans, for example, they feel like they have a right to say things like that. And then they start to go down the racism track of, I, I have ownership of this because my ancestors are from there. And then all the various people who have lived there or been born there, um, suddenly have no right because oh well we know more because we're pure right all of this is bullshit right i don't know if i can say that sorry <laughs> okay oh, that's <laughs> don't so me. It's, a nuanced... <laughs> right. it's a nuanced <laughs> question right um but i i think that what underlines it is i think for a lot of people there is a genuine want to connect right and whether that's connecting to a place through their ancestral connection or whether that is because there's just something about that place that calls to them. And this is where I talk about landscape as ancestor. Right? And sometimes, I, and this is, comes up with the idea of question of adoption. Many times people can be adopted by landscape, right? Because they have that connection with it. They go and they interact with that place. Um, yes, sometimes it could be a past life connection too, right? But even with that, then, again, it has to be understood that, um, uh, that 
having maybe a past life connection to a place does not necessarily mean that you have a right to it now right? You build that relationship now with it. And that's why it's the whole of the whole idea of, of ancestral veneration, as opposed to mourning, is about having a relationship with these dead individuals now, or these ancestors now. And that's where the idea of actually building your own relationship with landscapes that your ancestors once came from is really important. And I see so many times people go on pilgrimage. Oh, people go on pilgrimage. And all they're interested in is the ancient castles, the ancient sites, the, the magic of the place. And they're not so interested in the real social problems that are existing there now. Somehow the, you know, the poverty and the mindsets of the people over there now, the relationship with the people over there now is blanked, right? People will say, I want to go and experience the real whales. So take me to the local pub. And they walk in and they don't say a single word in Welsh in a Welsh-speaking pub, and it's like they wonder why nobody wants to talk to them. <laughs> I mean, it's one of those things, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. But I think, again, it comes back to that, that real interest in connecting and wanting to connect and wanting to, to belong is a big thing. And so we often think, I think, you know, because we have that family connection to familial ancestors, therefore the place that those familial ancestors come from is where we belong. Well, we belong wherever we are. And this has been my journey as I prepare to buy a ticket to go back home. Um, it's about where I belong over here in Canada, right? Because I didn't have a great sense of relationship with Canada. I never did. I never thought that this was my home. And so I never bothered to actually relate to it. But now in the past couple of years, since I decided to move, I actually started to realize how disrespectful that was to, to Ontario. No wonder Ontario, every time I would drive through my hometown that I grew up in for 25 years, no wonder every time I drive now through that place, it's like, oh, it's you again, right? Right. Well, you don't have that. that because I never, yeah, you know, I never saw it as a place to actually connect with and relate to, even if I didn't intend to be there forever. And I think this is where a lot of people in diaspora often can get it wrong. Um, and again, don't come at me, don't send me messages, don't send me, you know, hate mail. But I think like we're really starting to switch our view on this and understand that you no know, people who are born here, regardless of if you're a settler or if you're indigenous, you have a right, you you have a right to be here because you were born here. But that doesn't mean that the context of being here was right. I think that's really, really important. So Lori says, uh, let's see. My ancestors are Scottish and English, but I feel the, I'm not sure how to say that, Wasatch Mountains surrounding my home now are holy, sacred, and have some ancient magic that has been lost to history. The land wants me to remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And important there, why does the land want you to remember? Because the land probably wants you to remember so that you're grounded, right? Because if you're constantly thinking in terms of hivaif, right, then you're not actually focused on the land that you're in now, right? And that, that uh, in truth, that drives me nuts when people talk about your faith, because it's the land that may never, uh, the land or time that may never have happened, that may never have been. So if you're chasing that dream of that feeling of, oh, I'm looking, I'm searching for a land that never maybe was, then you, when you go over to Wales or when you go over to any place, and the reality of it doesn't fit with the, the, the dream of it, then what are you going to do? You're disrespecting that place by even being there, right? You know, sorry, I'm harsh with that, but so it's all the things I've been thinking about for myself. Because, like, you know, I, I, I was on um, I was on Obod's uh, fireside chats with Vima Burke a couple of mm -hmm. uh, last year, earlier last year, and she asked me, she was like, you know, what what do you think it's going to be like when you get over to the UK? And I had to sit with it and think, you know what? Yeah, what do I think it's going to be like when I go over there? Right? Because last time I was over there was about 15 years ago. And I had a wonderful time. It's beautiful. But so much of my experience at that place is through story, through, you know, all of that. I think that's what the impetus for me really heavily connecting with people over there is to actually, you know, ground myself so that when I get over there, it's not just going to be the fairies and the gods and this and that, you know. Mm. So I do, I do want to, you know, touch on your podcast, but before we do that, um, 
sticking with the ancestors for just a couple more minutes mm. before the end. For people who have not fully read the book or don't have it yet, please, everybody mm -hmm. go out and ta-da, see? So I got mine on Amazon. I Go local if you can. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. The best place for someone who's just starting this journey of wanting to venerate, honor their ancestors, where should they start? Well, I mean, to sound big headed, um, my book, because <laughs> that's really what I designed it for. I had oh, the benefit. Good, <laughs> right? Well, I, so I had the benefit of being involved with Lakumi, which um, African traditional religion, um, the, the really foundation point of any new person coming into that tradition is ancestor work, because everything else is built off of that ancestral work, right? Um, but it, it took me a lot of, of trying to understand myself as part of it, too. So this book is designed specifically for people who don't have the benefit of being in a tradition where ancestral work is a key component. Because we used to have ancestral work. Um, but I feel like a lot of, well, we used to have it in, in Western society. And then 100 years ago, the funeral industry came in. And um, and I hope I don't sound like I'm a, a conspiracy theorist here, but the, the funeral industry came in and they um, they made it into an industry. Suddenly you had people who didn't have a connection with death as much anymore because they weren't washing the bodies themselves. They weren't going and sitting in requiem masses. They weren't going to the graveyards to sit and be with the dead, right? Um, and so suddenly, you know, when somebody died, they were taken away and the next time you saw them was backlit with, you know, face makeup on and all of this right they looked like they were sleeping so people started to drift away from this understanding of what actually death is and that caused a lot of issues right so um you know all of the rituals and the traditions that surround death that have been part of western culture for such a long time went away we didn't have that as much right and um and so and so i feel like what a lot of pagans particularly don't have are even those few traditions are left couched in Christianity because of religious trauma, because of not wanting to associate with those traditions again, and also because of not really understanding how to or, or being unsure, how do I work with Christian ancestors, right? Um, there's an aversion there. So we're a lot of the tra pagan traditions are trying to find and recreate and form new traditions to work with the dead. The Dumb Supper is a very good example of that. Um, the, um, the, the uh, traditions of like Noskal and Gaiaf and, and, uh, and Halloween and all of those pieces really becoming a big thing too, right? Um, but that's coming, that's coming. And there's some pieces about cultural appropriation in there too, right? Um, so this book is really designed for people who they have a, an interest, they want to explore this for themselves. Um, and so this book was designed specifically for them. What this book will do is ask you good questions. This is a like therapy service um, between you and your ancestors, right? You have to define these things for yourself. You have to explore these things for yourself. Think about the worldview that you're existing within, right? Go for a year on the quest, very similar to what your own tradition does, right? Send you off on a quest to find the answers, to come back to the community. Same thing with this, right? You're not going to find any tradition to follow in this. You're not going to find any ritual to do. You're not going to find any way to set up an altar and anything like that because it's you relating and building relationship with your ancestors, depending upon who you see the ancestors are, right? So apart from my book, I would say um, check in with your cultural traditions, right? Check in with the 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 your your background. See what traditions you have in the family too see what traditions you have in the community that honor the dead and anybody who came before you i talk in this book about ancestors of 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 lineage i talk about um, affinity ancestors i talk about conceptual ancestors so this idea of like um you know talies in the bard or gwydion in in the mabinogi right i see them as ancestral to me because of the type of work that i do Right? In the same way that I look at other authors or other folklorists, particularly because my work with folklore, right? Catherine Briggs is incredible, and she paved the way for a lot of folklorists after her. Um, 
and uh, and and so I I work with the tools and I work in the mentalities that she laid down in the same way that a lot of the people from the eighteen hundreds. So so it's, so it's 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 developing that. So yes, I would say go and get the book, but also just look in your family, look in your community. What rituals? What is Catherine's last name? The, the... Catherine Briggs. Um, Catherine Briggs is um, the Encyclopedia of Fairies. Very very famous um, uh, folklorist. She passed away sometime in the 1970s, and, um, and she's incredible, yeah. In fact, the majority of the types of, of, of like, any of the, like, when we talk about fairies, about the knockers, uh, any, is, is from her work. Her going through all of these old folklore journals, pulling them out, re representing them back. And a lot of the major people in paganism now, particularly in the UK, either knew her or were connected with her, right? People like Ronald Hutton, people like Philip Cargon, right? They all were associated with her at some point in the past. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into her myself. Um, okay. Before we... Let's see. Then do you feel as though ancestor work should be its own practice? Or can we Wonderful include question. it? Is that Laurie? Yeah. Question. That's Laurie again. Yeah. Wonderful question. It's both. So it depends, right? So this is where, like going back to what we were talking about with Morgane before, we as human beings need to compartmentalize things just so that we create an ordered structure. But if you look at animism, animism is just one big continuum. It's just this part is deity, this part is ancestor, this part is fairies, whatever it happens to be, right? So for you, you develop your own. You develop your own. You know, if a deity is also an ancestor, then where's the dividing line between them? But if a deity isn't an ancestor, then in what ways is it appropriate to only do certain things with this deity and only certain things with ancestors? Right. If working with the fairies, for example, I know in some cultures the fairies um, are also connected with the dead, right? And uh, Anun, um, right? But certain things are not are not appropriate to do with them that you would do with, say, living or closer to your ancestors, right? So it really is it's an intuitive thing. This is why relationship is such a big thing. When you build a relationship with them in your own way, you'll know what to do, right? I hope that answers your question, Laurie. That's a great question. Thank you. So before before we end and before we ask if anyone else has any other questions, tell us about your podcast. You've been doing yeah, that for, for sure. a while. I keep seeing the <laughs> of course on Facebook. So so tell us about that. Well, one of the things when you become an author, and I hope you will very soon too, um, you will find that you have to do so much promoting. Um, in order to get your name out there, in order to just be visible with all the algorithms, algorithms and this, that, and all the other. And um, something that I clued into really, really quickly was that I need to network with other authors in order to not only build up that community, but also when it comes time to having endorsements. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the endorsements I have here, and I'm so pleased and honored. And I, like, I have big names like Danny Forrest, and um, uh, Mondo T, uh, Daniel Four, Ronald Hutton, which was really big, um, Jenna, Christopher, right? All of these people that I have looked up to for so long. And as I was interacting with them and reaching out to them, I thought, you know what, I could do this, but like in my own way. So what I did was I decided I'm going to do a podcast. Now, years ago, uh, during the pandemic, I did a full season with only like 12 or 13 episodes and I had Mara on and I had a couple of people from Obad on. And, uh, and I, I, it was so nice to get to know somebody who was also going through the same process as me. At that point, Mara was about a year in front of me. Her book was just coming out. And so I had her on and, uh, and we chatted. And it was cool because like she lives very close to where I come from over there. So it was nice, right? And I just really enjoyed that format because a lot of times you just sit and you get to chat with them afterwards and, and it's wonderful. Um, so I thought, okay, well, my book's coming out in later in the year. So I decided I'm going to do a summer series. So two years after I started my first season, um, I was like, you know, I know all of these people I've been networking with, all of these big, well, they wouldn't say big name authors. I would say that they're big name authors. I, I would, they, I would to agree. <laughs> right? But I'm like, you know what? I, I have access to a publicist who can introduce me to some of these people. I'm going to do it. I'm going to call it my summer series, and I'm just going to chat with whoever wants to talk to me. 
and it just snowballed. So I was able to get some really, um, well, all of my guests have been incredible. All of my guests are, are very niche, very part of the community. Um, so far, I've had like Chris Hughes on. I had David Barad on, which was cool. Um, Jenna, of course, came on. Um, but I've also had people like Matt Oren. I've had Devin Hunter. I've had, um, uh, well, Danu Forrest is coming on later in, in the year sometime. So as I started getting into it, I was like, you know, I, I, I can make seasons based on particular niches. So I finished my summer series. And then I started my uh, series in September, Into the Woods. And Into the Woods was uh, traditional and folkloric craft um, practitioners. Um, so I had people like Lee Morgan. I had people like, um, I can't even think. It's all just a blur. Really, really cool people. So I have about 50 episodes up, and they're still coming out. Um, and is that the name of it then, Into the Woods? Uh, it's called Essence Podcast. And then each season has its own like subtitle okay. name, which is kind of cool. What I'm going to do in uh, for in the summer, and I'm pre-planning it right now, is I'm actually going to do a uh, one called The Journey Home. And it's me interacting and interviewing some of the people, or a lot of the people from the UK. And I'm going to ask them those questions of what is what does landscape mean to you? What is working in this landscape affect your magic? Um, because there's a lot of people over there who haven't made um, kind of forays into North America yet. They're not as well known in North America. So I think it'll be really cool um, to, to, to talk to them. Um, of course, I'm going to have Mara back on. I'm going to have a couple of my other friends back on. Um, and I'm going to try and coax my friend Craig Spencer, who uh, recently came out with um, a translation of Radia um, through Llewellyn about a year or two, two years ago. He retranslated it because he's part Italian. I'm going to try and coax him out and, and see him. Um, but also some of the people like um, um, Anwin Avalon, who I believe also is part of the Sisters of Avalon. Yes, um, and she yeah. moved to Glastonbury. She to Glastonbury. So I'm, I'm curious to talk to her about that. On Instagram, she bought Dion Fortune's house. Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, I saw that. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm, I, I want to know what it's like for her to move from the West Coast of, of North America yeah. to be in that landscape again, right? Those are the types of questions I'm going to be asking. And it's going to really be my own process of going home, right? So I, I'm having a lot of fun with the podcast. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. But like some people, I end up having like three or four hour conversations afterwards. And it's just so, as an author, you can feel really lonely. And I know friends who are authors and they're not as well connected and it gets really lonely because you go through this amazing process and it's, it's, it's a horrific process, you know, but if you don't have people, you can just message like Matt Oren, for example, I can just message him and be like, you know, I can't can do this. Like, you know, he's like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Right. People who get it, people who've gone through it. Right. Um, but it's cool. I, I, I've been having an, a, a lot of fun with it. I tend to ask a lot of really in-depth questions and a lot of people are really enjoying my format of, 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 of working with my, my, uh, my interviewees and they all seem to love it too. So it's fun. It's really good. Well, hopefully a lot of people will watch this video and you'll end up picking up a lot more listeners. I'm going to go check it out myself. <laughs> And hopefully everyone as I said, we could probably by the end of this season we'll come to about 75 episodes. But if people are interested, particularly with the Celtic sphere here, um, I've got Jenna, I've got Dave the, the Bard, I've got Christopher Hughes has been on, and Tiffany Lazic has been on, good friend of mine. Um, I've got a couple of the um Halo Quinn, who is also part of the, the, the Celtic sphere here. Um, yeah, a lot of the, the Celtic focused folk are on there too. So um, yeah, go and check it out on face on uh, on um, YouTube and also on Spotify. Okay, is it on Amazon Music? Do you know? I think it should. I think I signed up for it. I wasn't sure though because it's very like when you get into the back end of it, it's like technical. So all right, know, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out and I'll let you know. <laughs> so, does anyone else have any other questions for Ben before we say goodbye for now? I see Deborah is asking me, will I have another book coming out? Yes, I will. I actually just contracted, um, but I can't say what it is right now. So you can um, you can watch in the next 18 months and you'll see it approach, but I can't say what it is right now. But I am having a lot of fun learning about Welsh magicians right now. So that's a little clue of... of uh, well, when you're ready to come back with your second book, wonderful. to come back on, you know, let me know and uh, we'll get you scheduled I'll up. holler at you I'll holler at you <laughs> holler at me holler at me 
Okay. Okay. All right. Then I can't. Oh, I can't it was so see. delightful to see you, Morgan. And it's, it's so nice to see you. To see your evolution too has been really cool over the past couple of Thank years. You. Like really, you look amazing. Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, let's keep in touch. And um, I wish you all the luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Shah, in the back end for doing all the all the um all the notes in the in the comments there. Thank you as well. Yes. That's mm -hmm. Shah is is in the back doing all the links and letting everybody in. And she's our Coracle tech person and she's absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could do any of this without her. So again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ben. We'll talk soon. Yes, I look forward to it. Have a good night, everybody. Nostar. Good night, hon.